Good afternoon, everyone. How is everyone doing? Had some popcorn, maybe a pop or a bubbly? I'm still working on one here. Thank you for joining this afternoon. So this will be the Economic Development and the Sustainable Development Goals panel. And we have the privilege of being joined by three esteemed panelists. Minister Louis de Jagger. So it's not Louise, it's Louis, and he's uh, representing, coming from the Métis Nation, British Columbia. We have, oh, Hannes, I, Hannes is online, I think, he'll be joining online from Big River Analytics. We have the United Nations Deputy High Commissioner, David Prodger. United Kingdom, excuse me, United Nations. I've been thinking about the great talk from this morning. So from British High Commission, Ottawa. And Audrey Hesdand, Gabrielle Dumont Institute. So we're really looking forward to hearing your perspectives and your views and having some time after some curated questions for some Q&A with the participants here in the room. So keep maybe a little bit on your notepad from your tote bag, some questions that might come up as these panelists speak to the curated questions or things that might be on your mind otherwise. So a little context. Since time immemorial, indigenous peoples have engaged in complex economic systems in a sustainable way. This panel highlights the importance of ensuring collaboration with indigenous peoples in meeting United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, such as decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, and responsible consumption and production. So to start off, I'm going to pass the mic, or they have their, each have their own mic, but they'll, each of our panelists will take the mic and introduce themselves, tell, you, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're passionate about the connection between economics, indigenous self-determination, and the SDGs. So we will start with you, Louis. Hello. Uh, bonjour, everyone. My name is Louis de Jager. I am the Minister of uh, Health, actually, and Minister of Economic Development and Tourism for Métis Nation, uh, BC. My ancestral families are Sinclair, Norquay, uh, Truthwaite, uh, Monkmans, all from uh, St. Andrews in the uh, Red River Settlement. And um, uh, I come to this as an elected official. We were elect I was elected in 2020 and uh, took on the uh, portfolio of uh, economic development, because I was a restaurant owner for, for years and years, and um, my mom was always entrepreneurial. Us kids worked uh, in her restaurant as well, and it's always been a passion for me. I was uh, with Stalo Community Futures as a board member there for 10 years, and I was always mentoring and, and helping uh, young Indigenous entrepreneurs and, and finding a space for them, really, uh, within, uh, you know, this whole ecosystem and, and what that meant. A lot of First Nations were really focused on sort of community businesses, and I was always out there, um, you know, flying the flag for... Um, not just two-spirit people, but, uh, you know, people who uh, were different uh, and entrepreneurs because we were fighting that uphill battle, um, especially in financing and trying to get our businesses and our ideas off the ground uh, to help communities. So, and um, one quick last thing is um, uh, I came in at a time when uh, Métis Nation BC was sort of really focused on um, maybe service delivery more than they were economic development. So we were victims of Enbridge at the time and there was a very uh, um, not so cooperative conservative government at the time and um, that was our only choice. So we were forced to maybe do things that didn't align with all of our values because we needed the money. Uh, we were getting nothing from nobody, from nowhere. Even recognition was tough for us out west. And, um, but we're here. And uh, we survived those times, and, and we made it work. Um, so I'm proud to be uh, part of Métis Nation 
this, uh, this time in my life and, and, and where we are now with this government and looking forward um, to, to cooperating and making those partnerships that are really going to make a difference and bring all of this to life and be really good partners. So nice to be here. Thank you very much, Louis. <clears throat> Next, to introduce yourself briefly, I'll give it to Hans, who's joining us virtually. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Hannes Edinger. I am AT, an economist, and the founder and managing director of a company called Big River Analytics. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, calling in from my home on Squamish territory. I feel like the punishment for not making it is that they put you up on a 12-foot screen and you get to see yourself just magnified in a room full of people. Um, so I started Big River in 2012 with a mission to provide statistical and analytical capacity to benefit Indigenous peoples, governments, and organizations in Canada. We're an interdisciplinary team. Um, we are economists, statisticians, and management consultants dedicated to leveraging this unique com combination of skills to advance the interests of Indigenous peoples. Um, and I'd like to, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to join virtually, not being able to um, have made it in person today. Thanks. Thank you very much, Hans. Okay, next I'll ask Audrey. Bonjour, Tanche Kakao Kiowao, Audrey Heston, Dish Nakashan. Labret Oscha Ma Fami. Hello, my name is Audrey Heston. I am a proud Metis. Uh, my family is from Labret. Uh, our family names are Blondo, uh, Klein, Hamlin, and Desjardins. Um, I am the Director of Training and Employment at the Gabriel Dumont Institute, and I've spent the last uh, 10 plus years there developing a model of Métis economic and um, labor market development um, that is Métis specific, and that's kind of my passion. Um, we do a lot of programming with Saskatchewan's Métis to ensure that there is a full economic uh, integration um, of our people, both in the labor force, in self-employment, um, and everywhere. <laughs> Fantastic. <clears throat> Thank you for bringing your passion with you here today. Uh, over to you, David. Thank you very much. And, uh Thank you for inviting uh, me to be here today. It's a real privilege, and uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Um, two things I suppose I would uh, sort of share with you in terms of why I'm so pleased to be here and why I'm here, pleased to be here, both in a personal uh, perspective, but also in a professional one. From a personal perspective, um, my sort of personal journey has been very much driven by the land around us. I'm a, uh, before I became a diplomat, and I've been a diplomat, uh, for 25 years, I had a proper job. I was a land surveyor. So I used to make maps. I used to be an explorer uh, for um, extractive industries and mineral minerals. Um, I used to work a lot on development programs around how we can provide assured, equitable access to land and assured, equitable ownership of land. And a lot of that was in developing economies, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, where we were looking at how we can best guarantee that access to uh, collectively held land, and also in Central Eastern Europe after the wall came down, where we were trying to reconcile historic land claims with those who've been using that land for a long time. So it, from that perspective, the use of the land, allowing access to the land, and how the land is looked after and the custodianship has been a really central part of my professional life before I became a diplomat, after I became a diplomat, it continued, actually, because I've, been, I've served in Argentina, in Belgium, in the USA, now here in Canada. Some of my work has revolved around working with our mining companies, for example, in places like Argentina, where it became clear that the only way to do business well was to do it with communities working for their benefit as well. Uh, and this became clear in a number of ways. Firstly, what was then corporate social responsibility, what is now ESG&I, um, but also from the fact that often the communities we were working with did not have a lot of economic options and actually 
having globally leading responsible companies driving that, and the UK is fortunate in the fact that our, um, both the City of London and the way that our economy is set up means that we have companies able to do this that have a really strong uh, economic and social underpinning means that we were able to offer as a partner, as an economic partner, um, partnerships that were really going to work over the long term. So from both the personal and professional perspective, it's great to be here. I am really, really pleased to be in Canada because I've got some unfinished business in Canada. My aunt lived here for a very long time, 40 odd years. I never got to visit her before she died. So from a personal perspective, it's really, uh, really important and really thrilling for me to be here. And I'll just, because of the company in this room, I'll just share one other uh, thought. We've tried to make the most of it. I've got three kids and my wife. My kids are basically in, in the UK, but come and visit. Getting them to Canada is really easy. We had five days uh, in the Algonquin last year. Uh, canoe camping, um, portaging, I can now do that. <laughs> uh, and I just finished a really fascinating book about the Voyageurs. So um, I, it's, it, uh, it's a real privilege to be with you today. So thank you very much indeed for having me. Thank you very much for joining. <clears throat> so we'll move to some curated questions. And I'm going to pose these questions to the panel as a whole. And then I'll ask that we have a volunteer from the panel to start. And I'll ask you to focus on one key point or bold point that you want to make. I'm sure that each of you probably will have plethora important points on each question, but just to make sure that we get a diversity of perspectives and voices for each. So when you do share, share one of your key points, and then I'm sure your colleague will share the next one that you had on your mind. <clears throat> so first question, what are some of the challenges and opportunities in fostering responsible consumption and production in collaboration with Indigenous peoples? I'll get it out of the way. You get it started. I'll get it out of the way. Okay, politics. Politics is probably the number one thing. Nobody wants to invest in politics. Nobody wants to be around negative politics. Um, that's probably our biggest Achilles heel right now, um, even amongst each other. Um, we need to be cooperating amongst each other as Métis uh, governing members. Um, but there are a lot of... Um, great pockets that are happening in Canada with relationships with First Nations. Um, I'll speak to a little bit of that, uh, some of the things that we're uh, doing. But um, that has to be the, the number one thing. It has to be about that sense of community and what grounds us and what joins us as Indigenous people. All of those values that we share, I think, um, you know, should be the number one focus, and that we're taking care of each other. Um, Kawichihitoyak is the word we use in Michif, is we all take care of each other. That has to be the basis of moving forward um, to tackle any of this work. And this is work. Um, we can't do it alone, and um, we have to be able to do it together. Um, it just, it makes me sad that, uh, you know, maybe some people can get ahead at, you know, at the detriment of us, not being able to be the best of friends. I always said the day that the, the Métis and the First Nations walk into the room is the day the government stops talking and starts listening to us. Thank you. We say thank you, Louis. I love it when someone takes on the, the challenges side of, side of thing. So appreciate that, definitely. Um, I guess I'll be greedy and take on the, the opportunity side of thing, um, especially when you know, we're here and we're talking about sustainable development and the goals that we have as, as a world, essentially. And really, you, you can't take the Métis away from sustainable development. It's, it's intricately tied to who we are as a people and just our nature, how we do things. Um, there is a huge opportunity um, to gain kind of that invaluable knowledge that we have for sustainable land and resource management. Um, the practices that we, we've had historically that have been passed down uh, generation to generation 
collaborating on environmental conservation and sustainable development projects um, can really lead to some innovation, so innovative solutions that would be beneficial to us locally and globally. Um, there's some huge opportunities there. Um, and also when we're, when we're talking about the opportunities, I'd be remiss to not focus on kind of some of the personal um, ones as, as Métis, on strengthening our rights and our autonomy. Um, we have, you know, not very many land bases as, as Métis. In Saskatchewan, uh, we just received some land at Batoche. And, you know, that's, that's really all we're looking at. Um, but we've always had a responsibility as a people to our land, regardless of who thinks it's our land or not. Um, it is, it's our land, it's our animals, it's our ecosystems. And having the autonomy and that self-determination through legal, political, and economic frameworks is important. And it's a huge opportunity for some of the government and partners out there to make that a reality because we know it's our reality. We know that we're there. But to have the recognition on a larger level is a huge opportunity moving forward. Very well said, thank you. Okay, David, would you like to add? Yeah, so I'll, I'll pick up on the opportunities as well, actually. Um, because I think there are a lot. I mean, I think, so we are, we're obviously a foreign government, but we've obviously, uh, as UK, have a very long uh, relationship, and sometimes a very complicated relationship with indigenous communities. Um, we shouldn't shy away about talking about that, but um, one of the reasons I'm here is that we're in the process at the moment through the British High Commission here in, in engaging much more, trying to listen much more, trying to understand much more how we can do things better and how we can work um, together. I think on the opportunity front, there's a lot we can do. I mean, um, you know, the UK is a trading nation. It kind of defines us, what we have been historically, what we are still today. You, you will no doubt be following what's, what's been happening since we left the EU. You know, this is very much about going back, if you like, to the roots of, of the, the sort of essence of, of the UK. Um, what I see, one of our primary roles here um, is about explaining the business environment. And it's about explaining um, how we can better work together and how we can leverage those relationships to actually make something which becomes more than the sum of its parts. Now, what I mean by that is that, you know, London is a centre for global finance. It's a, it's a centre for sustainable finance, and we might come on to that a bit later. But we're looking at areas where the UK can build partnerships that will generally, gen, genuinely change the way things are done. So we're looking at areas of natural uh, collaboration with partners like those here in Canada, uh, where innovation can really set the global trend, if you like. And so areas like agri-tech, areas like food tech, areas like net zero technologies, um, using the richness of resource and gray matter uh, here in Canada and with partnerships is really important to both of our economic futures. And I think what our role is, or my role and the team's role, here in Ottawa is to be able to explain to our UK colleagues why this is such an important mm -hmm. thing to look at and, and how we can go about doing it. So it becomes quite a didactic process because we know there are opportunities, we know there are great opportunities, and we know that as a partnership we should be really well placed to take advantage of them. But to be absolutely honest, if I go back to my colleagues in London and start explaining to this, the level of knowledge is really quite low. So our job is to try and help explain that. And for this reason, we are in the process of putting to, together a, a mission of entrepreneurs and SME leaders from uh, the indigenous communities to go over to London at the end of this financial year in March to start that process, to expose that thinking, to, to explain to each other what we're looking for in those long-term business partnerships, and particularly in areas where we know that the, the UK and Canada has got interesting and unique things to say. So we're looking to build those relationships and perhaps we'll come on later about some of the work we've been doing on the ESG side as well. But so I see very much our, our role is, is talking and understanding the environment here and being able to explain that to our companies at home so we can start building those bridges together. 
Fantastic. Holmes, would you like to add? <clears throat> sure. So firstly, we need a sense of just who's trying to collaborate with Indigenous peoples. It's, it's interesting. We've heard from the panel a couple different takes on who they imagined this question was referring to. Um, so I, I think the answer to the question varies a lot depending on the respective parties and their positionality. Uh, collaboration between two Indigenous governments with adjacent territories and a long relationship is going to look a lot different than collaboration with an external organization. Um, for my answer, I guess I'll just assume that we're talking about some non-Indigenous government or organization hoping to collaborate with an Indigenous government or organization. Even in this instance, I think the relationship, like the specific relationship between the parties would define the challenge and opportunity. Have there been historical injustices, a lack of trust, power imbalances between the respective parties? If so, it takes time and commitment to rebuild those relationships. I think the question is likely hoping for a bit more of a general answer. So if I had to generalize, I think the challenge and opportunity are two sides of the same coin. There are differences between Western and Indigenous ways of thinking and operating. These differences present a challenge. And if meaningful collaboration is beneficial to both parties, then having patience and in investing in the process is necessary. The opportunity is that a diversity of worldviews and practices can serve as an accelerator for developing innovative solutions to pressing challenges that would not otherwise materialize. So in as much as it's harder, um, there's also more upside because of that diversity of perspectives and worldviews. Fantastic, thank you. This diversity, this weaving of knowledge systems as an accelerator. And I love how you're bringing the business language into that too. And we heard from other panelists about, you know, the innovation and how when you have this diversity, you can actually have a result that's greater than the sum of the two parts. So I guess I'd like to ask the panel perhaps for more concrete examples of how traditional knowledge can contribute to more sustainable economic models when we do see this weaving in a respectful way. Um, so I'll start off, and, and if I may, I'm going to hand over to you, because I think there's an example that's helpful here. I mean, there's two things that I would point to here. One, um, as a government, you have the privilege of having a small amount of funding that you can put to your priorities. Um, for the UK, Climate change has been a huge priority. Biodiversity has been a huge priority. So we will work at government to government level on the big global agreements. You know, we work very closely with the Canadian government and others in the lead up to COP26, 27, this year's COP28. We work very closely uh, uh, in preparing and helping Canadian government do a fantastic job with biodiversity. COP15 last uh, just over a year ago in Montreal and then looking forward to this year. So government to government, that's fine. You know, one of the big areas that we're focused on is getting the right people in the room. So obviously indigenous communities are absolutely critical to this. Um, and we are doing similar with, for example, small island developing states when it comes to climate change. When it comes to here in Canada, we have a, um, a project running actually in the Arctic, which goes to your question, which what it's trying to do is marry up sort of today's science and the state of the art of today's science with traditional customary knowledge to be able to build a database to be able to track what is going on, what changes we're seeing, and then how we can put in place strategies to mitigate that. So it's the Canada Inuit Nunagat United Kingdom Arctic Research Program. It's quite a mouthful, but it's CINUC for short. So this is an eight million um, pound project to understand the impact of climate change on indigenous lifestyles. And then to look at, there are 130 projects, there, it's about halfway through the program, it's looking at everything from food supply to changes in customary lifestyles. So that, that's one example. The other example, um, which I just wanted to mention, was last year we invited six indigenous leaders and thought leaders to the UK to talk about primarily around um, environmental social governments uh, and the impact that has on extractive industries in particular. Uh, Minister was part of that program, so I'd be really interested to hear your views on it. But the concept behind it was we know that we are not able to develop natural resources in the way we wish unless 
all of the stakeholders and all of the people in, engaged in this are intimately involved. Obviously, here in Canada, Indigenous communities have an absolutely critical role to play. We know that at a global level, strategically, we need to be able to do this in a responsible but rapid way. We need to shorten the time frame in terms of how you bring projects for rare earths and critical minerals on stream in a way that's responsible, is responding to the community's needs and responding to the global economy. So what we wanted to do, uh, and I'll, I'll leave it to the Minister to say whether this worked or not, but what, what we wanted to do as part of this process was to bring together thought leaders from Indigenous communities to explain to our financial houses and to our policy makers in London what was required in order to meet those criteria that was, were important for communities, and at the same time that the finance houses in London were able to say, well, and these are the kinds of things we're looking for for a sustainable project that is investable when we're looking at sustainable finance. I don't know whether we got answers from the process, but the process itself seemed really valuable to us as a, as a thing to do, because that way it will take us towards the right answers. And I'm saying this from a representative of a government who has four uh, of the mining majors. It has two, at least two of the major oil companies. You know, we are going to need to find a better way to bring these resources on stream in an environmentally sustainable and responsible way because they're the resources we need to fuel the net zero transition that we're going to go through. We can't have a net zero transition unless we got the lithium, the cobalt, the rare earths, the copper, uh, and to some extent, the oil and gas. So to do that in the most, both sort of efficient economically, but environmentally sustainable and inclusive way we can, is an imperative, it is a geopolitical imperative for us. So this dialogue, um, was part of an effort to try and build that mutual understanding so that we can actually facilitate the flow of capital and de-risk some of that upstream work, which typically is quite difficult to get through unless you're able to have clear time frames, unless you've got clear um, deliverables in terms of payback over clear uh, schedules. So um, I hope that it was useful. And what we are trying to do as a result of that is come out with some guidance for our companies as to how they can initiate those dialogues um, in a better way. Thank you. Other panelists? Yep. Um, yeah, that was a really good trip. And um, what this was, was, you know, again, it's our values in this relationship building. Um, you know, it was very easy. They were packed rooms. I mean, the interest was really unbelievable. And we really talked about the nitty gritty about what's it going to take? You know, how do we get that foreign investment coming in? And how do we frame it through an indigenous lens so that we can get the work done, so that we can employ people, that there's procurement for everybody, Métis, First Nations, um, we worked on ESG plus I, and, and one of the conversations I can remember was, let's keep plus I, because it's like um, free trade. It's like a mark saying, you know what, we're doing ESG, but we're, we have a focus on that Indigenous lens, and we're committed to that Indigenous lens. So uh, hands up to the UK government for doing that. I think that was a really smart move, uh, because we want to move projects forward. I think the number one thing that came out of all of that is that indigenous communities, indigenous companies, indigenous businesses want to do business. We, we want to do business, but we want to be there at the beginning, not an afterthought at the end. And that's been the problem, at least in the Métis world. I just want to hone down a little bit to a little more macro level and just speak a little bit about like some of the other partnerships. We've signed the first ever health accord in Fraser Health with Stalo Health, Fraser Salish uh, nations. There's 32 nations and us making the decisions for all Indigenous people in Fraser Health. This is taking the decision-making process out of colonialism. It's now looking through a cultural lens and making those decisions of where we need, what facility, what we need, how much money we need, where. And this is, like, this is absolutely amazing because now we're, um, we're part of that decision-making process and that has never happened before. 
Um, the Métis Association of Capital Corps is another one. We're coming together. We're starting to talk about, let's participate in bigger investment. We see NACA, we see First Nations Major Projects Coalition. We see all of that going on, but there's not a Métis uh, business person involved in a lot of that. Programs are being written. We have to go to money to First Nations in order to get money that's supposed to be allotted to Métis people. We have to change that as well. So we're really in this process of change. These are exciting times. And I'm not being negative, I'm actually being positive because I think we have the right leadership in place to kind of get some of that work done. And the last thing is uh, we're, we're opening, we're on our third meeting now of operating our own credit union. Now we're gonna take the money that we do have and we're gonna, we're gonna focus that to get what we need. And I think that is control. That is the movement towards self-government that we're looking for. And that's going to help us do the work that we're, uh, we're all doing here. Um, and the last thing is that all of these things, self-government, education, healthcare, they're not site-specific. You don't have to own land to be able to have that. And that's what the government has been telling us for a long time. That's not true. We need to press the government on, those, on the UN Charter that, that makes us equals that our rights are not, they, there is no hierarchy. We're participants here and we're indigenous people living in this country. We have rights for success for our kids and for our people. You say I'm gonna focus in on the education piece because that's kind of where I, the, the world that I come from anyways. Um, when we're looking at sustainable partnerships and you know how can we do things in a better way um, it's doing things together. And we see more of that happening now. And, and I like the point that you made, Louis, that being involved at the start and not at the end as kind of an afterthought is, is really important. Um, one partnership that we have going on in Saskatchewan right now is with Gabriel Dumont Institute, um, SAS Polytech, and the city of Saskatoon. Um, our project is called Kanatan Nipi, and it is a water collection and treatment program. So we had industry approach us. They saw that there was a need for water treatment um, workers and that they wanted more indigenous people in that world because it, it's in our blood, it's, it's in our hearts to protect our waters. And there's a different kind of knowledge around water treatment and how we respect our waterways that's kind of passed down to us as Indigenous people, as Métis people. And we built this, this program using kind of the standard traditional curriculum plus a Métis component, bringing in elders and knowledge keepers to kind of pass down some of that traditional knowledge around our waterways and how we protect our, our lands. And we didn't just stop there. We didn't just say, okay, we're gonna have this program for Saskatoon. Well, Saskatoon had a need. And this is where I, I became involved with it as the labor market development side of things. That there's a need for these people all over the place. There's no point in training, you know, 12 or 16 people when there's three jobs in that community. Mm -hmm. So we were lucky enough that we had uh, educational institute and government partners that bought into this and said, okay, well, how can we make this work? and we found people from communities across the province that were interested. Brought them into the city to do this training, to learn and go back to their communities. They, they did their practicums in their home communities and were able to go back to their home communities to find employment. And it's amazing to see, you know, 80, 90% employment rates coming out of programs like this where before, you know, we might have 12 people go into a program and three get employed. Well, what was the point of that then? So when you get everyone out of their silos and kind of working together more collaboratively, looking and respecting the Indigenous knowledge that's brought into a program like that, really cool things can happen. And I'd love to see more of that. Can I just actually 
ask a quick follow-up question about that, just in terms of outcomes. So when you say really cool things can happen, can you give us a little flavor of what that one example might look like? <sighs> well, I'm going to say not specifically this program yet because it's still pretty new. Um, but we've been running apprenticeship programming for 10, 11, 12 years um, at, at Gabriel Dwan Institute. And in the past six years or so, we brought in entrepreneurship programming, self-employment with kind of the blessing of uh, ESDC. And one of the first things that we noticed, um, it's a delightful young man, um, he actually came up through the adult basic education system at Gabriel DeMond Institute. And because we had all of these different partners and all of these different projects together, we saw him come through the ABE system, get his grade 12, get into an apprenticeship. We helped him match up with an employer in Meadow Lake. He went through all four years of his trade, became a journey person, and then about three years after that came back to us through our entrepreneurship program because he bought out the business that he was working for and he wanted to continue that on. So instead of just training one Indigenous person, he's now taken on seven additional Métis apprentices in that trade. So it, it's that, you Thank know, you, that, you, 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 give, you give a Métis a bumps. fish and we're going to make you yeah. a feast. Fantastic. Thank you. Hans, I'm curious about your thoughts. Sure, yeah. Um, so... I think the best examples I've seen of tripartite partnerships, including Indigenous communities, external governments, and NGOs, is in the conservation space. Um, that's a space where the incentives of the respective parties are really starting to align naturally. Um, a specific really good example of this are the collaborative efforts to protect marine areas on the west coast of British Columbia, applying project finance for permanence approaches um, to solving some of those really pressing issues. Um, but getting back to incentives, um, you know, in term, uh, considering the, the, the respective incentives of the parties, you've got external governments whose mandate is increasingly reflective of the priorities of priorities for the natural environment that are coming into alignment with Indigenous worldviews. So as voters see the cost of managing resources and natural spaces in an unsustainable way, um, you know, they're pressuring their representative governments to manage in a way that is more in alignment with Indigenous worldviews. Um, we've got Indigenous communities and governments increasingly exercising jurisdiction over their ter territories in alignment with their values and worldview. And finally, you've got NGOs, uh, supported by those same voters influencing the mandate of non-Indigenous governments, trying to make a change in alignment with, again, similar values. Um, so what can we take away from the successes we've seen in conservation spaces? I think it's important to look for opportunities where all of those, all of the incentives of those respective parties are kind of naturally aligned because that's a precondition for the investment and compromise necessary to come up with collaborative solutions. And then the relationships that are built through those naturally occurring opportunities where incentives are aligned can be leveraged to collaborate on challenges where it might be a little bit less clear why it is that we all are trying to get on the same page. So yeah, I, we're kind of like, in my experience here, early stages and seeing some, some successful tripartite collaborations. And then what's really exciting is how those relationships can be leveraged um, on, I guess, to come up with solutions to future challenges. Fantastic. So I'll ask one more question of the panel, and, and they are somewhat interconnected, so feel free to make links to something you may have previously shared. How can collaborative efforts with Indigenous peoples contribute to inclusive innovation that respects cultural diversity and promotes sustainable growth? And maybe... Yeah, Audrey, why don't you... I'm going to say I'll go first because it seems like I'm hogging all of the microphones here. <laughs> uh, this, this was the question I was actually the most excited about. Um, and basically just to brag. Um, 
So I want to tell you uh, what I'm going to call a tale of two partnerships. So the first partnership I want to talk about, um, collaboration, if you would, um, and I'm not going to name the company on this one for which should become obvious reasons later on. Um, but at some point, uh, we were approached from a uh, mineral industry in Saskatchewan about you know, what they could do to sustain their workforce, to have more Indigenous representation within their workforce, as that was one of their sustainable development goals, and what they could do there. And what ended up happening is an external non-Indigenous organization was contracted to develop a training program that was aimed at Métis and Indigenous populations to kind of bring a baseline knowledge of that mineral industry. And as an afterthought, Indigenous organizations, tribal councils, Métis governments were brought in to say, hey, would you send some of your people to this program? And we'll, we'll take care of them from there. So a good program in and of itself um, to kind of be an intro to a specific industry, but it was missing that cultural component. It was missing all of the things that make us who we are and that make our people successful in educational programs. It felt a lot like tokenism, to be honest. And the price tag on that was massive. I'm talking 16 students and the total price tag was probably over a million dollars by the end of it. And that was, you know, industry putting money in it to pat themselves on the back and say, look at what we're doing. They're putting all of this money into advertising this amazing partnership that they're, they're having with, you know, the local indigenous folks. And four people got employment. It's tokenism. It's the unfortunate reality of the world that we live in is we're often kind of brought in as this afterthought to check a box. Another partnership several years ago, and I will name the organization because I love them, is the Iron Workers Local 771 out of Regina. They approached us several years ago um, because they saw a need for metal clad building training in our province. And they had made a specific goal of we want to increase our indigenous workforce. And they sought us out because we had an indigenous apprenticeship project. And they said, we don't really have the funds. We're, we're a union. We haven't been successful in getting funds to run a training program, but we've got the curriculum. We, you know, we can offer employment to anyone who comes out of this. And it just so happened that the Regina Correctional Center had a uh, group of inmates who were slated for release in the next nine months or so. We were able to work with um, ourselves as a funding agency, um, essentially, Miss Money Bags Me, um, the Iron Workers Union and the Correctional Center to take 12 Indigenous uh, men out on day release to do a 12 week training program with them in metal clad building. And that Iron Worker Union committed to hiring every single one of them. We worked with every single one of them throughout the entirety of their, their apprenticeship. And it was amazing to see that these, you know, 12 individuals who had just come out of the correctional system, they got into employment, meaningful employment, where they were valued and respected for who they are. They were given the knowledge and the skills that they needed to be in that industry. Uh, a bunch of them were actually flown out to BC to do work out there. And then a year after that, the union approached us again and said, hey, do you happen to have money again? Because all 11 of those gentlemen have put in the hours. They're ready to level up. There wasn't a single one of them that had 
any recidivism that ended up, you know, back in the correctional system. When Indigenous people are included and consulted at the beginning, we can put our own structures of support into a partnership, into a collaboration. And it's different than anything that you'll see out there. Like Louis said, you know, we're, we help our own. We're always there for each other. We have this sense of community, of kinship. And when we're included at the very beginning of something, mm. we can make it through to the end as a whole. That partnership alone was a tenth of the price. Yeah. Because it wasn't all about press. It wasn't about patting ourselves on the back. Mm -hmm. It was about making a meaningful change in a workforce for people. A tale of two partnerships. Wow, that was really powerful stuff. Thank you so much, Audrey. I'm going to hand it to Hans now to, to make a comment. He, he may have a a large presence here, but he doesn't have access to a mic. So you take it ahead next there, Hans. Sure. I, I mean, I don't have nearly as eloquent or nice an answer to the question as that. My thoughts were just that essentially, um, you know, it's almost by definition that collaborative efforts with Indigenous people, if the outcome of the collaboration is ultimately successful, will contribute to inclusive innovation. It'll respect cultural diversity and promote sustainable growth. That's kind of a truism, but I mean, it's, you know, collaborative, successful cl collaboration with Indigenous peoples will achieve that. If we want to be a little bit more specific, we can consider, you know, areas in which Indigenous worldviews tend to have, relatively speaking, a lot to say, like considering how land and resources are used. And when external parties successfully collaborate with Indigenous peoples on questions related to land and resource use, particularly in their specific ter territories, but also from a principal perspective, the collaboration is leveraging specific knowledge accumulated over millennia to inform their decision-making processes. So the nexus of worldviews in this instance is certainly more likely to be innovative uh, than in the counterfactual of siloed perspectives. And if the parties are both benefiting from the outcome, then I think we can be confident that the innovation is likely to have been inclusive, respect cultural diversity, and promote sustainable growth. Thank you for that. Now, I understand that you have you both haven't had the chance to speak on that, but I do want to give enough space for folks who came in the room and who have been listening to pose their questions. So perhaps you could thread your answer accordingly. So this is a one woman deal here. So I'm going to bring this second mic, unless folks wanted to come up here. If you did have a question, just put your hand up and I'll, and I'll walk it over to you. And if you really did love that other question. Oh, no, we do have one here. Okay. Tanse, Jordan Bernoff, Nisih Kassin. I'm a Métis woman from northern Saskatchewan. Um, a lovely presentation. Thank you so much. And your story, Audrey, was just beautiful. That's, that's a great show of, um, yeah, like you said, truly, like, by Indigenous, for Indigenous. It's creates a beautiful outcome. Um, I guess my question is just, so I work a lot in the climate and energy space, and you know, when we talk about energy, we talk, especially clean energy, and we talk about economic development, like sometimes those two are in competition. So I just, I just have a question for like, how have you forged the pathway, like especially around this conversation of sustainable development goals, right? Climate, is one of those goals. Life on land is one of those goals. Life on water is one of those goals. There are easy pathways that we can go to address climate change in a good way as Indigenous people adhering to our values and our language and our knowledge systems. But then we have this, um, this system of economics and of society that sometimes will intervene with that pathway. And, you know, I know there, this is the battle of sustainable development, right? Is to finding that balance. So how have you found that balance when, you know, one of the biggest global issues of 
hum humanitarian existence lies on addressing climate change, but we need to feed ourselves, we need to feed our communities, we need to move forward progressively. Loaded question, but I'm <laughs> really excited to hear your answers. Amazing examples. Um, so let me t let me just answer that from a sorry from a macroeconomic perspective in the UK. Um, so the UK uh, last week actually had the figures ratified independently. The UK has grown its economy uh, by 80 percent while reducing its climate emissions by 50 percent from our 1990 levels. Um, that's way ahead of anybody else, uh, any other developed economy. And the reason that was possible. Uh, is twofold. We basically decarbonized the electricity production, or pre pretty much. Um, Canada's already in a, in a good place for that. The second one is we took an economic bet very early on that actually net zero technology is going to be good economic policy. So we pivoted the economy very clearly towards becoming a global leader on um, low carbon energy. So we've got, in the UK, the four, four soon to be five biggest wind farms in the world. So we're lucky, we get a lot of wind, well, depending on where you live. But, um, so that was an economic decision made, you know, it was a gamble. I mean, we know it was a gamble, but then a lot of the original research on uh, climate change came from Nicholas Stern, a, a British academic, and therefore the government at the time felt as though we had to own this, obviously, from a historic perspective, but also from a future economy perspective. So that was a very clear decision by government to bet large on that net zero transition, try to get ahead of the economic curve so that we were able to build our future economy around some of those technologies. Now, you know, and the fact that we've now seen the benefits of that admittedly further down the line, I think means that it's not necessarily an either or question. And this is the discussion that we're having in the international forum now. You don't have to take to be able to gain, you, you can do both. Now, the, that, that political narrative does not, is not the same everywhere you go, clearly. Um, but I think what we would say is that we would do two things. A, we have shown that it is possible in our economy, uh, and we've shown that we're able actually to get ahead of where we thought we were going to be at this time. Um, and also, if we can do it, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to work with others to help them do it. So, so that, if you like, is the, the macroeconomic view. Yeah. Yeah, and don't think that's an easy conversation because it isn't. And it comes up at every MNGA and AGM and, you know, it's what are you doing? Why are we participating? We are participating and we're partners with uh, WIPG, with, um, with Métis Nation Alberta. And we're there with uh, 129 First Nations as well. So there, we're all in this together. We're also in the monitoring of that. So we're watching it, and we're the ones on the land. So participation um, to our partners and to us, um, it means we're in control. It means how much is too much. Our communities have a say in our uh, economic strategy. Um, so. Ours is just finishing being developed right now, and it goes through um, a committee of, of business people, and then it goes to our environment committee as well. And it's passed through that sieve as well to just see how much communities actually want us to participate, because they're the decision makers. The communities are the one that makes the nation. Um, and so it's a very delicate balance. And then what of the monies that are we making that we're investing? now in green energy. And that's why self-government is so important. So we can chart another path. We can start being better in healthcare, better in education, opening up our own businesses, being better managers, and start um, our economy growing on that level, not so dependent on just natural resources. But we want to be there, and we want to be at the decision table so that other people aren't making those decisions for us or for other First Nations. I say I can almost sum it up with uh, a, a little saying from the, the disability community is, nothing about us without us. 
especially, you know, coming from northern Saskatchewan there, you, you've got some interesting economic development going on in the region right now with, with NextGen and uh, the uranium mine that's being built. And it's, you know, it's been a struggle. Uh, there has been tokenism at the table of just, okay, we're going to pat ourselves on the back because we built a playground in the Losh. But what does what does that do for the community? What is what does that really do for the children in that community? Does it give them a better access to food, to clean water, to recreation, the ability to actually go out and play? There's so much going on in people's lives that, you know, there, there's bigger things to that can really impact. Um, and especially when we're talking some of the these industries and these economic development projects that are massive and they're on our lands <laughs> and they're affecting our climate and where we live insisting that we're there at the very beginning we're not there at the end we're there at the beginning make sure we're at the table and that we're genuinely at the table because it's our environment and we're the ones that are going to protect it not the companies coming in capitalism ruins everything let's be honest <laughs> it is a wonderful system sometimes but man can it ruin everything um, there are companies and organizations and, and governments especially that are realizing that when you put local communities and infrastructure and the lives of the people that live there as a first priority, it does make economic sense. Um, I can take an example from, again, the education world. We've seen a lot of programs in Saskatchewan, uh, Manitoba, I know Newfoundland has done it, where they offer student loan forgiveness for doctors, nurses, to go and fill a need in a rural, remote, or northern community. And after their three, five years are done, that person leaves, and there's a labor market gap again. And it's a cycle of they continuously do this. And they never have the thought of, well, how can I, you know, what else could I do? How could I better fill this need? And it, the answer is community-based education. Go to that community, train people in that community to provide that service, and they're gonna stay there. It, it's, it's so blindingly obvious to us, but not to other people who are looking through a much larger lens. Sometimes we really need to be looking in at, through that micro lens at a community-based level. Thank you, Hans. Did you want to add? Sure. I feel like I have to come to some defense of my profession here as an economist. But um, I think my answer is just essentially that um, in as much as we see this conflict between, you know, the unsustainable use of the natural environment and resources and the kind of financial benefits that that kind of practice can lead to, um, I think good economics is about recognizing that we have natural accounts as well, and that if we're operating unsustainably, we're drawing down from those forms of natural capital, turning them into financial capital. And if we're not investing, um, if we're not investing th that financial capital, if we're just spending it on an ongoing basis, um, we're making ourselves poorer and we're fooling ourselves. We're not as rich as we thought we, we, thought we were when we're operating unsustainably, ultimately. So, I think good economics is, you know, like triple bottom line, full cost accounting. We take careful consideration to ensure that we know when we're operating in a way that's unsustainable and drawing down from our natural capital and converting it to financial capital. Um, you can think of this even as, you know, the, the capacity of the atmosphere to absorb carbon as being finite and an account. And so um, if we're not paying for it, we are using up an account um, that is finite and unsustainable. So um, I would say good economics to the rescue and um, it's certainly a necessary and worthwhile endeavor. 
Thank you. A nice array of perspectives on that great question. We have about four minutes left during this breakout group. So is there a burning short question? Just, uh, I don't know, question or comment, um, but uh, we've talked a lot about partnerships and collaboration on, re on projects and perhaps when it's relating to land and economic resource development. And I just want to be, you know, clear it up. And when we talk about partnerships, is it actually having an equal partnership between the rights holders and maybe the private enterprise or the governmental organization? Sorry. <laughs> or is it is it uh, is it involving the other group? So having an equal partnership, having equal say in an enterprise, especially concerning land and rights, or is it? at a lower level because, in my mind, what we're looking for as Indigenous people is having that equal partnership. Mm -hmm. um, everyone having a seat at the table, equal voting in governance and management. Great point. Panelists, would you like to speak to that briefly? Again, from a government to government level, we, we operate at that macro level again. But I mean, what I would say is that we are in, in the free trade negotiations that UK are having with Canada at the moment, we're suspended uh, at the moment, but the aspiration is obviously to bring that through to have one of the most ambitious free trade deals we can. One of those aspects is to have an indigenous chapter in there, which will codify that to some extent. So what that means is, um, and we, UK, we, we're sort of starting out down this route. The first time we did it was with New Zealand um, with respect to the Maoris. Uh, and there it was really, the idea was to strengthen the relationship between the UK, New Zealand, and Maori enterprises. So the idea is that that chapter sort of codifies the, co the international level of that cooperation to make sure that the work that you're doing bilaterally and the investment and trade that you're doing bilaterally takes into account the needs of the indigenous communities. So we're just in the process of, of working that through and seeing how it works in practice because the deal was only signed a couple of years ago, but that's certainly an aspiration and something that we're talking to our Canadian colleagues about. I just have a quick one there. Um, I think a, a lot of it should be goal-based. There are things that we don't have the capacity to do where we could partner up and we could learn from that. We could get our objectives um, done by having the partnerships. I say that because um, right in the beginning, the federal government threw us a bunch of money for housing, and it's like, here we go, and now all of a sudden we're developers, and we're, you know, and we're probably doing a, a worse job than anybody because we haven't got a clue what we're doing in that field. That's where you need to bring in those, those partners who have that expertise so that you can learn. And wherever you need to do that on every different level, I think it could be joint ventures, it could be all kinds of things, but the main thing we need to do is to have the relationships, and that could be with First Nations as well. Um, I, I would say just, you know, have an open mind when it comes to economic development. Maybe a final key message. No, I just wanted to say good, good question. <laughs> <laughs> Hans, would you like to make a final point? Mm, I mean, uh, I think it's an important question. I'm glad it was raised. I would say in my experience, um, there's a lot of rhetoric. Um, we hear a lot of commitments being made at high levels towards the type of equal partnerships that were described. And I haven't seen a lot of it materialize. I will remain cautiously optimistic and hopeful. But when the rubber hits the road, I think those natural power imbalances tend to rear their heads. At least that's been my experience. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining. What an interesting panel. I mean, we had some really high level thoughts, conceptual thoughts, and we had some stuff really grounded with concrete examples that were quite inspiring. So I would like to thank again the panelists and to all of you in the room for your participation and your presence. Thank you.
And so we will be going back to the main room for a few closing remarks.